Good morning, everybody. So the problem with having a doctor uh, sending me off for two years, two and a half years to, to become an academic is unfortunately now I'm an academic. And so I'm going to give you a, a lecture on some biology and some maths and maybe a little bit of anthropology, a little bit of physics. So I hope you don't mind that. Um, it, it, unfortunately, a little less practical than um, than what Ari just had, but I think there's a nice fit because Ari's been talking about how we restructure teams. I'm going to talk about how, we, how integration teams in particular have to fit with the architecture and how the architecture has to fit with the team. So that's very much in line also with what Jennifer was talking about yesterday. So I hope you're going to see some, some continuity. And of course, it's also very much in line with what uh, Tyler was talking about. So, do we have any mathematicians in the room? Excellent. So if you're a mathematician, you love this. This is, I'm a mathematician, and this is one of the most amazing formula in, in mathematics. It, it basically takes the key constants, the, the main, you know, some of the major ideas of maths, e, i, pi, 0, 1, plus, and equals, and, and somehow makes them into a formula that's true. So, so when I was young, I loved maths. I, I just, I adored it. I did maths at university. It was, and I also liked physics. You know, here's another amazing equation, right? E equals mc squared. You know, this is one of the fundamental equations of the universe, and it's five characters long. I, I hated biology as a kid, and this is a biological equation, right? That it's not quite so beautiful, is it? It's not so, quite so complex. This is basically genetic uh, transformation modeling as an equation. But I have learned to look to biology and to, to stop relying on maths and physics. And the reason why is that biology is the study of complex systems. And fundamentally, enterprise architecture is a complex system. It's not a simple, you know, e equals mc squared thing. I think too long we've treated enterprise systems architecture as something that can be simplified, that we can build nice, easy abstractions. A and I think that's not true. So I've started to look to biological metaphors. I don't know if any of you were here last year. Uh, I talked a lot about how genetic adaptation is a, is a very strong metaphor for what we're doing in Agile. That we are going through fast iterations. We are trying to become, we're trying to turn our code into fruit flies. Scientists study fruit flies because they evolve quickly, because they have short lifespans. We want to build fast adaptation and agility so we can iterate faster, so that we can evolve faster as code. And that's definitely the world we live in. We are disaggregating our systems so that we can be more agile. We can be more agile in three different ways. We can, we can be more functionally agile. We can recompose these components faster to create new function. We can be more agile in terms of scale and performance. We can scale up and down in cloud environments. And we can be more agile. We can react in real time to data as it comes in with this disaggregated architecture. And fundamentally, what that architecture is, is it's a deep disaggregation in two dimensions. We've spent the last 20 years building smaller and smaller functional components. So those are things like we moved to DLLs in Windows. Anyone remember DLLs? We moved to web services. And, and SOAP services. We moved to service-oriented architecture. We moved to APIs. We moved to these smaller and smaller functional components. And that's one dimension. But we also started to disaggregate in terms of the infrastructure. We started to pull the infrastructure, part the code away from the infrastructure. We moved to standard operating systems. Uh, my first project. Uh, the first job I ever got, I was porting code from one computer to another because the code was specific to the physical computer it was on. 
We moved to operating systems that gave us some portability. We moved to virtualization and cloud. And now we have containers. We've abstracted away from containers. Now we have all cloud orchestration, which makes it even easier for us to redeploy code quickly. So these two things, I think, is really what we call cloud native. And, and this move is helping us get more agile. But this in itself is not going to get us agile. I think that's what Ari was saying. You know, it's not a technical thing. We also have to think about the other problems. And that is clearly demonstrated by this uh, data that, that Tyler talked about yesterday, which is that a lot of companies are doing agile, but that agility is not seeming to come out at the enterprise level. The, the projects are agile, individual projects are agile, but they don't feel that the whole organization can adapt agilely to market conditions. So that's a really interesting bit of data. So what's going wrong? Niels Bohr, who's a physicist, had this line. He says, an expert is a man who's made all the mistakes which can be made in a particular field. So I'm going to talk a little bit about some of the mistakes we've made in SOA. And I, I feel like I'm a bit of an expert on SOA. And I, I feel like I know a lot of the mistakes we've made. And I think one of them is that we, in the integration space, have been one of these problems to agility. It, it is the integration that is often the bottleneck between that agility at the project level reaching the corporate level. Because the agility of an individual project is great. You know, we can get a particular digital transformation out or opportunity out. But as soon as you have a few of those, now the next one has to work across those. You have to work with those. You have to integrate. And that now has to become agile. And that's now a challenge. So what is Agile about? Well, it's about developer flow. Agile is about getting your developers so that they can be effective in a simple flow. That flow is that they want to code, they want to build, they want to, to run it, they want to test it, they want to debug it, they want to iterate round and recode, and they want to go through that loop quickly. And the, the tools that have made developers effective with that flow are what have made developers rock stars. I, one of the things I've heard all, all week and, and continuously is we can't find enough good developers because the, the, there's in such demand, there's such a demand for developers who have skills, who are agile, who are effective. And that's because of this flow, this, this, this enhancement of the developer flow has made them uh, effective. And, and of course, it's not just an individual developer. We need team flow. We need the team to be able to get on with its job and to be effective. And that's really the, the challenge here. The challenge in integration is how do we make our integration teams agile? How do we get the flow for integration teams? And what interrupts it? Well, the wrong organization interrupts flow. We've all been at a meeting like this, where everyone sat around eating biscuits, looking at their laptops. Not, not, they're like, what's going on here? You know, wasting time. We've all been in situations where we're waiting on another group to do something. And that's what Tyler was talking about with these gates. When you have a, a, an integration organization where there's a center of excellence, and any time anyone needs to do some activity, they have to go to the center of excellence. They're waiting on that center of excellence to do something. That's interrupting the, the agile flow of that team. Actually, I, I forgot. I love this. So, so a lot of people call this fast waterfall. One of my customers, uh, the chief architect for Jaguar Land Rover, he calls it wagile, which I think is a great word. I encourage you to take away wagile. Um, this, is a, this is a great tweet from a guy called Johnny Burkholz, who's an 
analyst at 451 Group. He's like, you say center of excellence, I hear silo. It's just a new silo. We don't want more silos, we want less silos. So, you know, that's a bad sign, isn't it? And, you know, here's another thing we got wrong. You know, I participated in things like this at IBM. Luckily, at WSO2, we've never really got involved in this kind of stuff. But, you know, this, I mean, certainly our customers have, and we haven't said, look, you're doing it wrong. We've helped them out. But this kind of uh, process and organization assessment, this top-down assessment for SOA, is painful, it's slow. And what happens? You spend a year of paying some expensive consultants to come up with an SOA assessment, and by the time they've, they've provided it, your, your organization's moved on. Your requirements have moved on. And this layered stack is very, very good in lots of architectural ways, but it definitely interrupts team flow, because every layer is a boundary between people. Every layer is a different ownership domain. And this is fundamentally why microservices as an architecture is, is gaining traction. It's saying that you, you break up this layer, the data, the uh, functionality, the, the capabilities are all owned by one team. The DevOps, everything, there's no layer. There's a single layer. And, and that goes back to Amazon. Amazon first pushed this. It was an excellent uh, interview with Werner Vogels from Amazon in about 2001 in the Association of Computing Machinery. And he says, well, you know, we have small teams. And, and their mantra is, you build it, you own it. It's not about these layers. So what I'm saying is that we need another dimension to this story. We need an organizational dimension. This is not just about the technology. We have to somehow create a, a, a space where we uh, apply the organizational aspects and the technological aspects together. We disaggregate the organization. And that's exactly what Ari was saying. You take those waterfall steps and you take people from each of those steps and you merge them into small teams where the, the team owns it. You disaggregate the organization as well as the technology. And that's really what Agile is about. So we have this Agile manifesto. And I'm just going to concentrate on this top line. The best architectures, requirements, and designs emerge from self-organizing teams. So what does that mean in integration? How do we build self-organizing teams in integration? So self-organizing behavior is really interesting. If you look at biology, there are lots and lots of examples of self-organizing behavior. So for example, fireflies at night all start to flash at the same time. Uh, when you see a big flock of starlings flying through the sky and they all seem to move at the same as one, that's a self-organizing behavior. Uh, there are things called films of cells that form, uh, and they aren't always good. So cystic fibrosis is basically to do this laminar creation of, of cell films. And no one really knows how it happens. They don't know if they're all competing, if the cells are all being selfish, and that it's more effective for them to live as a film, or whether they're cooperating, and whether they're sharing, and whether it's more effective for them to cooperate. The, the, the patterns on the back of a butterfly are actually a self-organization of cells. All of these cells start out the same, and as they grow on the butterfly's wing, they self-organize into this pattern. No one quite understands it. It's amazing. Um, every cell starts out. So this, so this is a, a zygote. This is the, this, the birth of any, uh, of any kind of biological thing. It starts out as a single cell. And as it divides, it creates a self-organizing pattern. 
This is how we form. We start as a single cell, and we divide and divide, and somehow we end up with eyes and nose and hair. Part of it is genetic, but part of it is this self-organization capability of those cells. So I guess what I'm trying to say is, if, you're, if, you're, if you want to build an agile set of teams, the, the, the last thing you want is a command and control structure saying you are going to form into self-organizing teams. Do you know what I mean? That's not going to work. You have to somehow create an environment where those teams can flourish, those teams can be self-organizing, and they can be effective. So it's about creating the right environment for self-organizing teams. So what is a self-organizing team? A self-organizing team is a team that manages its own work. So it, 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 it's in charge of what it does. It's not, there's no one saying, you need to do this. They take responsibility for what they need to do. They pull work. They're proactive about saying, we need to improve this function. We need to improve this flow. We need to improve this integration. We need to improve this API to be more useful for our users. They don't require this command and control infrastructure. They communicate effectively with each other. They're not afraid to ask questions. And they take responsibility for their own skills and responsibilities. They, they take responsibility for learning, evolving, finding new technology, bringing it on board. And, and they don't need to be pushed to do that. So self-organizing teams don't have a project leader. They don't have a hierarchical structure. They have a facilitator, a scrum master, or someone who is a, what often called a servant leader. That leader is there to help the rest of the team, not to tell them what to do. And of course, there's this two pizza rule. So this is famously Jeff Bezos's concept that you know, we're told to communicate more. His answer was, we need to communicate less. We need to have smaller teams. If there's more than uh, two pizzas worth of people in the room, something is wrong. If your team size is over 50, 10, 15 people, by the way, these are meant to be American pizzas, so they are quite large. <laughs> two, pizzas, two pizzas team in, in, in the UK, kind of, you go to Pizza Express, that means two people. That's not effective. <laughs> so, so this is a kind of American two pizza rule. And there's some science behind it. So firstly, let's start with the maths of it, right? The number of connections between n people is n times n minus 1 over 2. So if we have 10 people in a team, there are 45 connections. There are 45 individual relationships between all those people. That's crazy, right? That's mad already. If we have 20 people, then there are four times as many of that. You double the number of people, you quadruple the number of connections. So instead of 45, we're suddenly at 180, right? And this leads to something called relational loss. So there's research. Uh, they, they did a study of 212 knowledge workers. And they basically identified that when the, the teams get bigger, they become less effective, people are more stressed. And it's because they don't know the other people in the team. They can't trust them. How can you create that kind of team where we're all in it together? We don't have a, we don't have a manager. We're not told what to do. We take responsibility if you don't know and trust the people in that team. So you have to have small teams to make this work. Now, you saw Asanka present this yesterday. Cells are the way all biological systems are organized. And this is, I think there's something to learn from this, right? There's something to learn. Biology is a successful paradigm, right? There are, there's too much life on this planet, mainly, mainly in the form of humans. You know, seven billion of us seem to be overtaking the planet. 
but we're effective. And, and you know, there's a lot of other effective organisms out there too. There's meant to be more fungal matter than anything else. You know, think how many ants and cockroaches there are. So there's lots of successful biological systems out there. And they're all based on this idea of cells. And when you look at a picture, a, a, a microscope picture of a set of cells, what do you see? You see the boundaries. The boundaries are what enable those cells to be effective. Effectively, there's, there's all these atoms, right? There's atoms and molecules all, and if it weren't for the cells, it would just be a big gooey mess, wouldn't it, right? It's those boundaries that provide the structure, something called the cytoskeleton, provide the structure that allow those cells to be effective. So this is what we need for our agile teams in integration. We need the right boundaries. We need to start to create the boundaries so those teams can be effective in a domain, and they're not waiting on another team they, they can get on with it. So, and, and, you know, this, I think, is really the heart of the why SOA failed to live up to its potential. We assumed that we were just one big, happy team, right? That was the assumption of SOA. We're all one big team, and we're going to build services for the common good. Now, I don't mean to be cynical. I am cynical, but I'm trying not to be cynical. <laughs> so the cynical view is, oh my god, that's just, you know, everyone's out for their own thing. I literally went to see one customer and I said, well, they said, we can't do SOA because, you know, no one trusts each other. And I said, well, at least you could have a registry of services. They're like, no, no, we're going to fight over who runs the registry. <laughs> Literally, this guy told me, this was, this was a big oil company, he said, literally, every department's going to fight over who, who gets to run the registry. And, and I, I wasn't cynical enough. I should have listened more to this guy, shouldn't I? This was about 15 years ago. I should have listened to him and thought, he's got a point here. So this is, a, this is an old slide from a guy called Dion Hinchcliffe. He, he did this about 10 years ago, and he was like, I can see SOA is not succeeding as much as it should do, but all these public web services, public APIs are succeeding. This was long before API management became a thing. And he's like, it's about these attributes of open APIs. It's about the boundary and getting the, the, the right concepts at the boundary, things like billing and licenses and tracking that, that are making these things successful. And this is fundamentally about saying, we're in different teams. It's OK to be in a different team. If you, had to, if you had to go and sit in a meeting with PayPal every time you wanted to add PayPal to your website, it wouldn't have worked. They built it so that you didn't have to talk to them. You didn't have to wait for them. There was no, there was the boundary meant that you could be effective. The boundary meant that we could say, OK, I can just go onto PayPal's website. I can sign up as a developer. I can, I can get a key. I can start doing transactions. So these, these boundaries actually enable you to be more effective and to get on with self-service, with fair use, with all those kind of things. And APIs are fundamentally designed for boundaries. That's what APIs are about. So what does that mean? It means that authentication is required and expected. I'm not going to just assume you're part of a happy family. Tell me who you are. And I'm going to give you authorization or not. I'm going to throttle you. I'm going to, these all sound like, you know, uh, why would you do that to your friends in the same company? Why would I need to do that to my colleagues in the same company? But actually, these boundaries create trust. If I know that, that I can't abuse this system, I also know that no one else can abuse this system and that it's going to be more resilient and more robust. And fundamentally, in SOA, we assumed that you know, if you build it, they will come. We, you create a SOAP service, someone will use it. In an API management environment, you don't make that assumption. You do your best to make it easy for them to come. 
You make it self-service to sign up. You put samples and forums. You treat people as if, you have to, as if they are not part of your team. You have to attract them to your site. You are selling something, and you want people to come and buy it. So you run hackathons. You do all these things that are going to, that are going to say, actually, I'm not going to assume you're going to use my service. I'm going to do my best to get you to encourage you to. And of course, it's really important that these boundaries require identity and access control. I think this is a real, uh, a, something that is really, you know, it's something we spotted a long time ago. You know, we started our identity server for this very reason. But if you just look at what's happening with service meshes, with things like Envoy, you know, everyone is now building mutual TLS, token management, these kind of security and identity systems right into every bit of middleware, into every bit of communication inside or outside your organization. And this is a really important aspect of building these boundaries correctly, is that you have to put identity and access control at the boundary. So there are two really key concepts. And, and uh, Sanka mentioned them yesterday. There's been other talks. But there's this concept of a control plane. So in us, the control plane is our nervous system, our brain and the spinal cord and, and the nervous system. That is fundamentally the control plane. It's not about getting data, uh, business data around. It's about getting management data around. So for example, this identity management is part of the control plane. Whether or not I can call an API, that decision is made by the control plane. And then there's the data plane. I don't, I don't know what the data plane in the body is. I think the best guess I had was the, the blood system, the vascular system. Because unless you get that oxygen around your body uh, and the nutrients around the body, then you can't, you can't do any work. So, so that seemed to me like the, the, the best example of the data plane. So when we have this brown field and green field, I, I, I love this picture of Asankas, and I actually changed my presentation. I stole it yesterday. I thought this was a great picture. So every, uh, everyone in the, in the room yesterday said, I have some brown field and I have some green field. I think there was maybe one person who was just brownfield and one person who was just greenfield. So we're all in this position. We're all in this position. We have legacy core systems. We have new development. And what does it look like? Well, for most of us, we're, we're built, we have those core monolithic systems, and we're now trying to build disaggregated new systems for greenfield. Is anyone building new monoliths in your greenfield? Hands up. It's, it's, there's no shame. There's no shame. Yes, there we go. We have someone who's building new monoliths. So there's definitely that argument, uh, the monolith first argument. Uh, I don't know if you've read this, but basically there's some people saying you should not build a microservice first. You should build a monolith first and then disaggregate it once you understand what you're doing. There's a great article on that by Martin Fowler. But most of us are building disaggregated systems for the greenfield and, and keeping our legacy systems. And somehow, these all have to work together. We need to integrate them. So let's just get rid of that background and, and talk about how we do that. In my mind, the, the answer to this is that we need to wrap those core systems with APIs. But more importantly, I think all the integration between these core systems needs to go through these APIs. I think we need an API-centric view of the, of, the, of the integration world. And why is that? Because we have governance, we have dependency management, we have identity. Effectively, the ESP is just a data plane. We need a control plane as well for all integration. And this control plane gives us a lot of benefits. 
not just for the, the greenfield stuff talking to the brownfield, but also for the brownfield stuff talking to the brownfield. Because we want to be able to, uh, you know, even these core systems, they're not just one, one person, are they? These are teams themselves. And these teams have boundaries between them. So when the SAP team talks to the Salesforce team or the Siebel team, there's a boundary there. And using an API to smooth that boundary and to manage it is a good thing to do. The other thing is that these disaggregated systems are growing rapidly. So I talk to numerous people who have already got hundreds of microservices. I, I, I have a, a friend who's a lead developer for a shopping comparison site. They, they're a small team. They have about 10 people. It's a very nimble, agile organization. They already have 200 microservices. And he's the lead developer, and he doesn't know what they all are. I heard recently of a bank that has converted its CICS transactions to microservices. They had around 3,000 tra Kix transactions, and they have around 3,000 microservices. And I'm looking at that, and I'm like, that, that's a new mess. That's a mistake we've made before. So we actually solved this mistake at WSO2. We used a technology called OSGI. OSGI gave us modularity within the JVM. It gave us boundaries. You can hide stuff as well as expose it with OSGI. And that's fundamentally the concept behind a cell. The cell is saying, take those services that you've disaggregated and re-aggregate them into, into higher level components. And the re-aggregation is about hiding, not exposing. Exposing stuff is easy. Hiding stuff is the important thing. Because you know, you know that rule, every, every problem in computer science can be solved with an abstraction? Well, almost every problem in computer science comes from a leaky abstraction, right? When you don't hide stuff and people who are in this cell find out about this cell and start calling it, and they weren't intended to in this microservice, not this cell. So this, you know, suddenly there's some API on this microservice that they wrote for their friends here, and they didn't expect anyone else to use it because they're part of the same team. And some other team finds out about it and starts calling it, and now we're stuck. I worked on a project for Cisco where we built everything using a protocol called XMPP. Has anyone used XMPP? Excellent. So it's a very nice protocol, all built in XML. It's, it's, it had some really nice features, and, and it was a good fit for this project. The problem was that one of the teams didn't go and look at the 58 XMPP libraries for every possible language that were out there. They built their own. We don't, I never found out how they built their own, why they built their own, but they built their own XMPP library, and they didn't read the spec properly, so they built it wrong. So we, we, labeled, this, we labeled this BXMPP. The nice word was broken XMPP. The, 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 the real meaning was bastardized XMPP, right? They messed this up. So they said to us, you've got to build an, an, a, an adapter for your ESB that supports BXMPP, not XMPP. We had one of those. We'd built an XMPP adapter, but no. So about three months later, they fired the team that had written the BXMPP stuff, and they killed the project. But by now, everybody had built this on the BXMPP, and the whole system is still, as far as I know, running on BXMPP because we had a leaky abstraction. Right? We, we didn't have the right clean abstraction. We relied on some messy thing under the covers that we shouldn't have done. And we all ended up using it. So we do not want those leaky abstractions. And that's really what a cell is about. So these, these boundaries are really what's important. A cell hides what's inside it using something called a membrane. And there's this thing called transmembrane signaling. 
We call it ingress and egress. This is an API gateway that is only letting certain messages through one way and only letting certain messages out the other way. This is, this is what is going to give our, our cells a boundary, and that is going to let us actually get on with things and, and move forward. So within the cell, you can do what you like. Outside the cell, you have to stick to your transmembrane signaling receptors. These have specific receptors that only respond to certain messages. And that's how cells protect themselves from the outside world. So I think a really important point here is the cell boundary is the team boundary. These cells are about teams. This is not about building something that is functional. Your function has to be married to the team. You can't, this cell metaphor is not going to work unless each cell is owned by a team, one of those two pizza teams, so that everyone inside the cell communicates. They have the daily stand-up meetings. They have the agile environment. They can now be as agile as they like within that cell boundary. Maybe I should have put this the other way around. Maybe I should have said the team boundary is the cell boundary. It's math, so it, in my mind, it's the same. But sometimes when you say things out loud, it sounds better the other way around. Sorry. So is this video going to play? No. I tested this video 85 times, and it played every time until today. Let me try this one more time. Let me go back. Forward one. Hey, there we go. So, what? <laughs> Stop heckling me, Tyler. Did I heckle you? Yes. <laughs> no, I did not. <laughs> so, what this video is of is something called sponge reaggregation. You take a sponge, uh, Halcinea SP, and you shove it through a sieve, and you basically force the cells to, to decompose, and then they naturally recompose into, into sponges again. That's what I'm talking about. We have decomposed the architecture into microservices and dis disaggregated components. We need to let these self-organizing teams re-aggregate into cells. So APIs everywhere enable these boundaries and the boundaries enable the teams to become self-organizing. Unless you have that boundary, you don't have small focused teams. You have one big team that is not, that is not self-organizing. It doesn't fit into the two pizza rule. You get this relational loss. This is where these problems come in. So my view is that, the, that there's a technology model that we need that supports the Agile. I, I said that very carefully. The technology model supports the Agile. We've typically done it the other way around. We've started out with an architecture, and we've tried to fit the organization to the architecture. I'm saying that we need to start thinking about fitting the technology to the organization. You know, we can change technology, we can change architecture. Changing human nature is beyond the scope of WSO2, right? It's beyond the scope of everyone. That's what Agile is a fundamentally a, a, a reflection of. It's fundamentally a reflection of the fact that human nature is human nature, and we are used to working in these small teams. There's, a, there's all this theory about hunter-gatherers and small groups of hunter-gatherers. I don't know what the origin of it is, but it's clear from those, those, the science, from the maths and the, and the anthropology and the sociology that beyond a certain team size, we stop being effective. So what I'm saying is we need to create a kind of Petri dish for our self-organizing teams to grow in. And that Petri dish is about creating the right environment and that creating the right environment is about creating the right boundaries, about creating self-service and governance that is not an imposition. It is something that people can pull and, and be effective with. 
One more thing, and I've only got a minute, so I'm running a bit late, but there's one more thing I think is important. This is something called an MTT assay. Any, anyone know what that is? No, I didn't know what this is. My, I had to ask my daughter. She's studying biology, and I was like, Anna, how do you measure cell health? She's like, oh, there's this thing called an MTT assay. Basically, the more purple it is, the happier your cells are, right? And it's because, I don't know, you put some yellow liquid in, and the cells, happy cells, thrive on it, and they convert it into purple liquid. I don't know. Um, but fundamentally, if you can't measure it, you can't improve it. So we need measures of cell health. We need measures of agile team health. And this is probably the most fundamental measure, which is flow time. How long does it take us from, from getting the business case approved to being done done? to being, having something in production. This is fundamentally the most important measure of, of flow. But there's another important measure, which is how long it takes us to fix it when it goes wrong. Right? We can't just rely on getting it right once. We also need to be able to fix it rapidly. So this is what blue, green, and rainbow deployment are all about. These are really important. And you know, this is something we're very focused on. You know, our, you know, we have SLAs that we offer you guys on how long it will take us to fix stuff, and we have to stick to them. There's one more, which is about flow efficiency. Well, there's a lot more, but this is one more I want to focus on. And this is really what I'm talking about with these boundaries. And this is what Tyler was talking about with the agile steps, what Ari was talking about, about the getting everything in a waterfall. If you have an environment where your team are waiting on other teams, your flow efficiency just drops because you spend the whole time waiting. So fundamentally, what I've been talking about this whole time is how can we shrink those wait times? How can we increase the flow efficiency? And if we increase the flow efficiency, then we can reduce the flow time. So, I'm going to summarize now and finish. We have these boundaries for agile integration. You need a clear global data and control plane. So that is going to provide a boundary around your core systems, around your legacy. But it's also going to provide a global data and control plane into which the cells can fit. You need to provide clear boundaries for teams. And things like self-service and APIs are going to do that. And you need to give the teams freedom to evolve within those boundaries. And that's fundamentally what our, our methodology, our, our, our agile methodology, reference methodology that Asanka has published is all about. So I highly recommend you read this paper. It's uh, on our website, but it's also a GitHub uh, project now. And <coughs> Sorry, I need a drink. And you can, um, you can get, you can basically submit pull requests. So, so if you think it's wrong, or you want to agilely evolve it, then please do. So, to summarize, we've got recoupling of decoupled components into new agile teams that are self-organizing. Based on those teams with DevOps, infrastructure, and intra-cell communications, we can build agile uh, systems that are agile within the cell, but versioned and managed at the cell boundary. So I want to leave you with this quote by Fulton Sheen, which says that every science is based on an abstraction, and this is how you differentiate between them. And I think in enterprise architecture, we need to get to the point where we're a science and where we're differentiated by the right abstractions that help us build systems that, are, that meet the needs of our business. And I hope that this has been a help you think about that for the rest of the conference. So thank you very much. <laughs>